All right, let's take a look at review problem 4.5 concerning the correlation of x minus, if I've got three random variables, x1, x2, and x3, we're going to find the correlation of x1 minus the average with the average. Now, I'm not going to do this one the shortest possible route. I'm just going to take this the most direct route, and let's see what happens. So the correlation of x1 minus a and a is equal to the covariance of x1 minus a and a divided by the standard deviation of x1 minus a times the standard deviation of a. And so uh, by definition this is equal to um, the, uh, let's see, well by the properties of this I can split this up. I can write this as the expected value of the product x1 minus a times a minus the expected value of x1 minus a times expected value of a divided by the standard deviation of x1 minus a times the standard deviation of a. And so that's using um, the definition of covariance. Now hypothetically I could have done this by the bilinear property of covariances and split this up as the difference of the two covariances. That would have also been acceptable. Okay, well let's see what happens. So first off, the denominator. So let's do the easiest stuff first. The variance of A is equal to, well A is the average, so one-third x1, where n is 3 in the problem, plus one-third x2, plus one-third x3. So this splits up as one-ninth times the variance of x1 plus one ninth times the variance of x2 plus one ninth times the variance of x3 and so that's sigma squared over nine three times so this works out to be sigma squared over three so that's the uh, variance of a from which I can get the standard deviation uh, next let's figure out the variance of x1 minus a and so this works out to be the variance of two-thirds x1 minus one-third x2 minus one-third x3. So if I just simply take x1 minus this fraction, I get this. And so this is equal to four-ninths times the variance of x1 plus negative a third squared times the variance of x2 plus negative a third squared times the variance of x3. And so adding to these together, we get 6 ninths or 2 thirds times the uh, variance of uh, x1. Okay, so take the square roots of both of these and I get the denominator. Now let's get the top. Well, first off, the expected value of x1 minus a that's equal to the expected value of x1 minus the expected value of a. So that's equal to the expected value of x1. And then this splits up as one-third the expected value of x1 plus one-third times the expected value of x2 plus one-third times the expected value of x3. And so this works out as mu minus one-third mu plus one-third mu plus one-third mu. And so that's just zero. Okay, so this part I've got, this part I've got, this part I've got. That's zero times something. Well, the expected value of A is mu. So I've actually got this, but it's going to be zero times mu. And so the last thing that I need to get is the expected value of x1 minus a times a. All right, so this is going to be a bit of a mess. x1 minus a is going to be this part right here, 2 thirds times x1 minus 1 third times x2 minus 1 third times x3. And a is 1 third times x1 plus one-third times x2, plus one-third times x3. All right, 
right, so let's uh, multiply out. Um, well, let's see, I've got a one-third everywhere, so I can factor that out. So with, if I pull the third out of this and the third out of this, that comes out as a ninth. So expected value of 2x1 minus x2 minus x3 times x1 plus x2 plus x3. Okay, so let's multiply it out. So expected value of, all right, so here I have 2x1 squared. Here I have 2x1, well, let's get the squared terms first. Then I have minus x2 squared. Then here I have minus x3 squared. And then let's get the cross terms. So here I have 2x1, x2, then I have minus x1, x2, that gives me plus x1, x2. Here I have 2x1, x3, I have minus x1, x3, so that's plus x1, x3. And then I have minus x2, x3, then another minus 2x3, so minus 2x2, x3. All right, now how do I evaluate this? Well, I should take a little reminder that the, the variance squared is equal to the expected value of x squared minus the mean squared. And so that means the expected value of x squared is going to be equal to the mean squared plus the variance. So using that formula, we have uh, 1 ninth times 2 times mu squared plus sigma squared minus mu squared plus sigma squared minus mu squared plus sigma squared. And notice that these are going to cancel. Over here, by independence, I have the expected value of x1 times x2 is going to be the expected value of x1 times the expected value of x2 by independence. The expected value of x1 times x3 will be the expected value of x1 times the expected value of x3. And we have uh, 2 times expected value of x2 times expected value of x3. And lo and behold, all of those cancel. And also over here, these three cancel, and so I end up with simply zero. So combining, this is going to be equal to zero minus zero times mu over the bottom we have sigma over square root of three times square root of two thirds times sigma, which works out to be simply zero. And so our final answer is that the co correlation between x1 minus a and a is equal to 0. Now, does this make sense? Well, so just to do a quick calculation here. So x1's here, x2's here, and x3's here. And so the average is just geometrically somewhere like that. So here's x1, x2, x3. The average is wherever it is. What this is saying is that the there is no correlation between the difference between x1 and a and the position of a, which kind of makes sense. Um, if I know the average, then any one value could be, is equally likely to be either above or below the average. So knowing the average gives me no extra information about where I, x1, x2, or x3 is. And so it does make sense because I don't know if the value is going to be above or below the average if I know the value of the average. All right, now this is probably going to be dangerous because I didn't practice this ahead of time, but let's take another look at this calculation. Now, one of the things that I had to figure out was the covariance of x1 minus a and a. And let's see if I can get this a different way without uh, the, uh, without the which hopefully slightly less messy than what I just did. And I can use the bilinearity of the covariance function. So this is the covariance of x1 and a minus the covariance of a and a. And I know that the covariance of a and a is the same thing as the variance of a. Okay, so let's see if this works out to be the same thing. As should this now, we worked this out to be zero last time, so let's see if this works out to be zero again. The variance of a Earlier, we worked out to be sigma squared over 3. Okay, now let's look at the second part. The covariance 
of x1 and a is equal to the expected value of x1 times a minus the expected value of x1 times the expected value of a. So that's the expected value of x1 times 1 third x1 plus 1 third x2 plus 1 third x3 minus the expected value of x1 times expected value of a. So expected value of 1 third x1 squared plus 1 third x1 x2 plus 1 third x1 x3 minus the expected value of x1 times expected value of a. Okay, now how does this work out? This will be 1 third times mu squared plus sigma squared as before. This will be 1 third mu squared because this is 1 third times expected value of x1 times expected value of x2 by independence. Likewise, this third term is 1 third times expected value of x1 times expected value of x3 by independence minus the expected value of x1 is mu and the expected value of the average we worked out earlier to be mu also. And so sorting out the pieces, this is equal to sigma squared over 3. And therefore, coming back up here, this is equal to the covariance is sigma squared over 3. The variance is also sigma squared over 3. And so that is a second way of showing that the, the covariance of x1 minus a and a is equal to 0. So this is a different way of establishing the same property, uh, appealing to the bilinearity of the covariance function.